Even if we're looking at the education system back to like elementary school, high school, it really relies on young children to be able to sit in a classroom of 30 or 40 of their peers and be quiet when they're supposed to be quiet and pay attention the whole time. You know, there, there's really a lot there that, it, that is being asked of a young person. And so somebody who might be coming from a family uh, with a higher socioeconomic status that might have like lessons on the side, that might have parents who, you know, teach them how to behave in this situation, what, what is socially appropriate, you know, the entirety of that system is set up based on one idea of what it means to be productive, of what it means to be a good participant uh, and a good student. And that idea comes from really, um, you know, privileged and powerful assumptions. So it's not meant for people who face a lot of different types of marginalization. Now, when we look at it at the university level, I think that there is a lot within universities invested in this idea that, um, oh, why don't you come to our mindfulness workshop and learn time management skills? And that's all great. I'm not against time management or mindfulness workshops, but I think that if you look at those things as an apolitical way of kind of off-putting responsibility, well, the university will happily provide your mindfulness workshops, but they uh, will not recognize <laughs> that their students are people and that they're people who are coming with complex lives. Some of them are helping to support their families. Some of them are working full time. Some of them are really, really struggling. Some of them are international students who are you know, adjusting to a different culture, a different language, uh, an entirely different set of norms. And so uh, the more that institutions, including universities and education systems more broadly, the more that they get to kind of depoliticize uh, and take these easier steps and cheaper steps, quite frankly, of, uh, you know, mindfulness and time management and here's how you kind of survive university uh, it's it's still a kind of one-way communication and I think that a lot of people in the world who experience injustice would like the opportunity to speak back and that opportunity to speak back to institutions right now it, it simply doesn't exist I think we've been seeing more and more especially these last few years since COVID more and more powerful attempts to speak back, but I don't know that we've actually seen a, a breakthrough of an institution that has actually said, okay, we're listening. So I think that there's a lot of excellent individuals who, who really do try and who really do approach their students as complicated and complex individuals um, who are able to bring themselves in their entirety into the classroom. But again, even with that faculty, it, it falls on them at an individual level and with minimal institutional support, oftentimes. So although we see a lot of, um, a lot of people who are really trying to do their best in this moment, they're still working within the confines of administrations that that again have a lot invested in not seeing the whole person. I, I am curious to see what we do keep and what we don't keep from the pandemic and uh, and how and kind of accessibility standards through the pandemic. What I have been noticing and also you know colleagues of mine teaching disability studies who are having to go in and teach in person again uh, and their students might be asking, well, can, can we have these lectures online as well? And they, they're really trying, but it's a, a lot to ask. Uh, and it's a lot, again, that tends to fall on, um, on faculty. And, and a lot of those faculty might be sessional and adjunct faculty. So they too are working with minimal support. Um, and so I've been finding it kind of interesting that the faculty will be requesting to continue teaching online for a disability studies course, no less, <laughs> and, and asking for that as an accessible feature.
of the course and being told no. So I, I think that's absolutely true. I think in the pandemic, it was amazing in those first few weeks, especially to observe um, the switch to online and this kind of hyper awareness suddenly of accessibility and, uh, you know, a willingness to accommodate that just hasn't previously been there. And so I do worry uh, in moving back to in person and I'm not against moving back to in person, don't get me wrong. Uh, I too miss being in a, in a classroom with people and gathering with colleagues, but um, but I think that there's a lot of fear that I notice with myself and with my colleagues that accessibility is not only falling out, but there's kind of a almost a resentment towards it. Well, we've given you these last two years, you know, <laughs> what more do you want? But if somebody needs those accommodations, well, they, sorry, <laughs> they do need more. I notice too, uh, more and more, which I find promising in accessibility statements on people's syllabi. Um, I think in the past, there has been strangely this push for professors to put in their syllabi and to tell their students, if you need uh, any accommodations, don't talk to me about it because I might stigmatize you. Go straight to accessibility services, go straight into this hyper-bureaucratized process that is uh, often critiqued by people who use it. Uh, and and I, I don't want to hear it because my administration is telling me to tell you I shouldn't even be hearing it at all or else I might stigmatize you inadvertently. And so I've been seeing more and more rejection of that, which I'm so happy to see. Um, and, and more and more professors just saying, look, if you need to be accommodated, come talk to me first. Let's see what we can do. If we can avoid accessibility services, wonderful. Um, Yes, yeah, so I've been seeing more and more professors just kind of take a more informal approach and let's see what we can do as people together to try and make this class a valuable and meaningful and comfortable experience for you. And if we can't, then of course, that's what accessibility services are for. But to not take that kind of bureaucratized approach to accessibility as the first and only way to approach. So that's a change that I've been finding really promising. You know, and actually, maybe I will just throw in one last thing, which is, oh, that is pretty cool. <laughs> um, which is the University of Toronto's mandatory mental health leave policy, which has been widely criticized since its inception um, by students, by faculty. There's been so much organizing that's gone into stopping this policy, and it's just been pushed through as though none of that were happening. And I've gone, I mean, I've since stopped going to them, but I went to some of the, the town halls that the university had hosted about this policy, uh, only to realize that it's not a genuine town hall. The, the participants can't see each other. We're not allowed to talk to each other. And anyone who starts to voice criticism is actually then muted and, and loses their platform. So it's, it's not really a, a town hall where there's feedback being sought, but there is also this kind of punishment where, yes, if you're not taking us up while we're providing all these resources for you, like these mindfulness workshops and these time management and, you know, whatever else uh, that are in place, uh, and not to, not to criticize those programs, I just don't think they stand alone. Um, and if you don't take us up on it, and if you're still having a hard time, and you're having a hard time in a way that we don't really want to deal with, well, guess what? You're not a student anymore. So there is also the threat of losing some of the things that are the most important to a person in their life, you know? And especially if you are under so much stress, oftentimes people are in school because they're hoping for a brighter future. They're hoping to engage with their minds, to learn, to be open to things, and hopefully to find a career that is meaningful to them. And so the threat of losing that, if you don't toe the line in the right kinds of ways, I think uh, goes hand in hand with how at least I understand these kinds of uh, superficial efforts to, toward, to support student mental health.